Hello and welcome back to Kitco Mining's Digging Deep, sponsored by Revival Gold with me, Paul Harris, in which we take a closer look at some of the most interesting news items in the mining space. Joining me today is Hugh Agro, President and CEO of our sponsor, Revival Gold. Hugh, welcome back to Kitco. Good to be with you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, please note, digging deep is not investment advice and the opinions expressed here are our own and not Kitco's. But if you like it, don't forget to subscribe. Hugh, let's start with the gold price at $2,500 per ounce. We seem to be edging closer to the gold bull rally really starting to charge. Hugh, what more does the sector need to do for, for a real breakout, do you think? Oh, gosh, uh, this is a bull rally. <laughs> $2,500 gold. Uh, I don't think uh, many forecasters would have expected that even you know, two, three years ago. Um, so this is a this is a bull rally uh, and it's uh, fantastic. We haven't yet seen it uh, fully work its way into all of the equities, senior gold stocks up some 30 to 60 percent here um, and the intermediates, a few of the select intermediates uh, and uh, it's working its way to the Explorer developers. Sure. what do you think, uh, under what conditions will that disconnect between the equity prices and the gold price disappear, do you think? Well, look, I, I, I think this recent uh, acquisition of a Cisco is a, a good indicator of how uh, important these development projects are to future growth. Uh, and if we have this uh, healthy gold price and these uh, very strong financials coming out, quarterly results coming out of the, the majors and the intermediates, um, I think we're going to see more of that, uh, that corporate activity in M&A. Well, um, the second quarter results, some companies seem to have done very well, others uh, less so. Uh, do you think the market was expecting a, a real bonanza in the second quarter and perhaps it hasn't really delivered? Uh, we've seen some really good results out of, uh, out of the likes of Newmont, out of the likes of Alamos, uh, and certainly Agnico uh, near its, its all-time high uh, in share price as a, re as a reflection of those results. So yeah, we've seen some great results this quarter. And I think we're going to see more. Um, this gold price uh, just is, uh, you know, carrying these companies with uh, with excellent free cash flow and and earnings. Now, some companies are suffering from higher costs uh, in what has been an inflationary environment. Uh, we can't expect all of that margin to accrue uh, to to shareholders. Uh, it's the same inflationary impact that's driving. Uh, gold price increase, uh, and um, and so we're not going to get all of that margin. But I think we're seeing some really good results out of um, out of the producers. Now, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of companies their share prices are up 30, 40, 50 percent this year. The sort of gold producers, um, when in in the previous sort of gold bull market, companies went up considerably. Well, what is the potential here? Do you think uh, is the potential for doubles, triples, and even more? Well, I, I, I wouldn't be in this uh, business uh, for the last 15 years uh, working through a very tough market if I didn't think there was a lot more upside. Uh, so, yes, no, I, I, this, is, uh, this is just the start, I believe. Uh, we haven't seen retail interest in gold and in gold equities like we've seen in prior cycles. A lot of this momentum in the gold price has been uh, as, as your listeners will well know, has been has, has come as a result of the the shift in gold demand uh, in the East. Uh, a lot of buying out of China and elsewhere, and that central bank buying has been driving the gold price. Uh, what we'll see next, I think, is retail interest in ETF uh, gold funds and the gold equities themselves from from a broader base of uh, buying and uh, and so we haven't seen that yet and i think there's a lot more upside to come now m a will add some spice to the sector and as you mentioned we've had some recent action with south african miner goldfields to buy cisco mining for 2.16 billion canadian a 55 percent premium there and with that it will consolidate 100 percent ownership of the Winfield Gold Development Project in Quebec in Canada. Winfield has scale and grade and is set to produce 300,000 ounces per year when it comes into production. Now, Hugh, as the CEO of a gold developer, this must give you some great heart to see an all cash deal and at a sizable premium. No, it's a super uh, transaction for the space and, 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 and indicative of the uh, potential for these development projects in a, in a market where uh, such projects are scarce. 
Uh, you've seen Skeena up almost uh, 50% here on the back of this news. Um, uh, Perpetua is up uh, significantly near its uh, recent highs. And, um, and so this is, this is good for the sector. But I think what it really demonstrates is the importance of patience and staying power in the venture space. Um, it's been 10 years from conception to realization for a Cisco. Uh, a lot of hard yards, uh, ups and downs. Kudos to John Brzezinski and uh, the crew at Cisco for that success. Now, Goldfields has been trying to get into Canada for a while and previously tried to buy Yamana Gold. Hugh, one of the surprises here may be that Goldfields did not buy a Cisco uh, outright last year when it ended into a 50-50 joint venture for Winfield with the company. What do you think there? Well, look, if we look at the share price movement before that joint venture, uh, you know, it, it was really on a on, on an uptick up from about three dollars a share to four dollars a share, and I think probably, you know, Goldfields looked at that and said, "Are we really going to pay a premium on top of that?" Uh, instead, um, maybe a less desirable transaction at the time for a Cisco. What Goldfields did was this joint venture. So uh, you roll forward this year on on lower risk, having some further knowledge on the asset, they've been able to buy it uh, on a premium. Of, of a, on a lower uh, price. I think this has been a win-win transaction, uh, but the market worked in Goldfield's favor, and I think they were able to use their cash and their good name uh, to, to secure a first look at the, the asset and then uh, follow on with the full transaction. And I gotta say, it's a great transaction for Cisco shareholders from my perspective, and I think also the joint venture was a, was a smart move back in May last year. Uh, they, the folks at Osisco had to keep the momentum going, and they were able to secure uh, that uh, momentum with the Goldfields joint venture transaction uh, while they continue to progress the assets. So I think this has really been a good uh, a good transaction for both companies' uh, sets of shareholders. Time will tell, uh, but this is an asset that's got uh, ten years of mine life. It's a high quality asset in uh, a great jurisdiction. And gosh, they've they've only uh, really uh, brought resources up to about uh, 1,200 meters below surface. Lots more potential beyond uh, what's in the current mine plan from my uh, from my seat. I want to bring a bring in another figure related to this uh, this deal here, if I may. Goldfields paid 300 Canadian 300 million Canadian for that first 50% uh, a year ago, and now 2.16 billion for the second. Um, that puts the overall project cost at let's say 3.2. Billion, project, uh, billion dollars for gold fields. In addition, it's probably going to have to spend around $800 million to build the mine. Um, with the 7.4 million ounces of uh, it's getting there, that works out at over $400 US per ounce uh, for that transaction. Um, again, as a developer, that must really open your eyes because I think uh, prior to this, the average is what, around $50, $60 per ounce for acquisitions? Yeah, I, I don't know about the apples to apples comparison there, but uh, let's step back at the bigger space. Um, there are not many 300,000 ounce a year producers out there in good locations, and Goldfields in particular has been looking for over two decades to uh, bring opportunities uh, in, in the North American, South American space, time zone, uh, and, and geopolitical risk jurisdiction. So I think this is a special asset for a special circumstance. But, but look at also the exposure here. Um, you know, uh, 7 million ounces of total resource um, in, a, in an upward moving gold price environment uh, in, a, in an operation that's uh, got very low costs and um, is already at the feasibility stage. Um, there's been bulk mining uh, testing of the, uh, of the resource. Uh, so it's a relatively low risk transaction for gold fields. And sure, they've paid up for that first $1.7 uh, billion of uh, Canadian of NPV, but there's another uh, plus or minus 3 million ounces in inferred. And as I mentioned earlier, they've only drilled down to um, 1,200 meters uh, in the resource. So uh, lots more upside here to this asset and lots of option value in a strategic situation for gold fields. This is a win-win, I, I believe. Okay. Goldfield said it offered all cash as it had competition for windfall and maybe had to offer something that others could not. Q, to what extent uh, do you think this will usher in a new wave or more M&A activity in the gold space? 
Well, yeah, I, I think um, I, I think this has been a horses for courses here. This is a special situation for for gold fields. We've got another two dozen senior and intermediate gold companies that are going to be looking for assets, though. And um, it's interesting to me that the windfill opportunity and some of these more recent uh, in, in investment opportunities in the gold space have been on underground projects. Uh, so you're, you're, you're seeing that with windfall, with Malartic, uh, also in Nevada uh, with the uh, Newmont and Barrick joint venture going underground. Uh, so it just speaks to the scarcity of near surface opportunities. A lot of these have already been found or, 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 or mined. And I think as this gold price goes up, uh, the scarcity is going to get uh, even more compelling. And the investment case for exploration and development in good jurisdictions is going to get uh, even more robust. Okay, now this is obviously a big positive for the sector, but uh, let's reflect now on a big negative. Uh, the past week saw the government of Yukon in Canada put Victoria Gold into receivership after losing confidence in the company's ability to respond to the June heat leach failure at its Eagle project. Price Waterhouse Coopers was appointed as receiver and it and the government will fund the mitigation work, the cost of which will be treated as a loan and recovered from Victoria's assets. Victoria's board resigned and CEO John McConnell was terminated. Hugh, the government seems to have uh, stepped in very fast here, uh, but, but perhaps the key word in all of this is confidence. Losing key stakeholder confidence is never a good thing in the mining space. What do you think is, is really going on here? Well, I agree with your assessment. Uh, obviously, there's been a breach in, in confidence and uh, it's tragic. The whole situation is tragic and it's going from from bad to worse, as far as I can see, you know, first you've had this uh, failure of the heap leach, uh, the risk to the environment, the loss of jobs for uh, Yukoners, uh, the the loss of sponsorship of some of the great uh, community programs that Victoria had, uh, Gold had undertaken, uh, and the and, and the lack of um, uh, confidence in the in the situation for for the board to have resigned. Uh, it's tragic all around, really, and. Um, and, and I don't think it's um, it, it's really going to improve very quickly. Um, you know, there's some questions about the decisions that the government, uh, as I understand it, has made with respect to the site, and um, and so it's no surprise to me to see the board at uh, Victoria uh, uh, remove itself from the situation with the receiver now in control, uh, and an accounting firm no less. Uh, this cannot um, this cannot get uh, get better in the short term. I'm afraid. Okay, um, what do you think the fallout of this incident will be for other junior gold developers? I imagine you know a lot of people are concerned about this, and so perhaps we can see regulators, communities, and so on, um, looking sort of twice, three times, looking harder at the, the the project proposals coming to them. Yeah, sure. I mean, the obvious thing is it's a reminder uh, that single asset risk is a is a is a, uh, a real cons you know a real challenge and issue. Um, also, the importance, and this goes back to the earlier comments uh, at a Cisco of staying power and and um, sustain you know sustainable uh, funding to be able to advance one's projects and get through those difficult startup and uh, phases of an operation. So I think these there's some lessons here for the industry. Um, I'd also say though that uh, and and you know that communication is really important. I think. I think if there's one thing uh, you know that uh, we might uh, observe here is that there just was not a lot of communication out of Victoria Gold, and uh, and that that probably uh, fed uh, some of this um, you know some of this negativity and this uh, mistrust or uh, lack of confidence that uh, you referred to earlier. Yes, yeah, so, well, when things happen, over communication is perhaps uh, the preferred thing. Um, and also, I think reflecting on your point about uh, the, the vulnerability, if you like, of single asset companies, uh, I think one of the key differences you can draw between what's happened with Victoria and SSR mining in, in Turkey, where it had a, a failure at Tukupla. SSR is a multi asset company, it has cash flow coming in from various operations, and so it's able to sustain the distance of all the investments that need to happen to write what's happened there. It, it, indeed. Um, you know, it, it, bringing it back to, to Revival Gold for a moment, you know, we obviously think about asset diversification and uh, ability to, 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 to move 
uh, you know, effectively with uh, with our team and with our dollars. Uh, so even at the, the junior level, it's important to have some measure of asset diversification, but also to be thinking about the myriad of things that can go wrong in a in a project. You know, choosing sites that uh, that offer um, you know a, a better environmental situation or a better community situation or a better technical situation. It's not just the discovery of the ounces that matter for an explorer or developer. It's all of the things that go into producing cash from those ounces of gold. And so, you know, at companies like Revival Gold, we spend a lot of time uh, on conceptual engineering plans, conceptual community plans, conceptual uh, permitting uh, plans long before we put those plans into action to understand what our alternatives are. And I know many of our fellow uh, operators do the same thing. And uh, this is a challenging business, so you've always got to be uh, able to be um, uh, have, have some optionality in what you do and how you pursue things. Okay, thank you, Hugh. We have a lot more to come, but we're going to take a brief break for a word about our sponsor, Revival Gold. Revival Gold, ticker RVG on the TSXV and RVLGF on the OTCQX market, is one of the largest pure gold mine developers in the United States. The company is advancing engineering and economic studies on the Merker Gold Project in Utah and mine permitting preparations and ongoing exploration at the Bear Track Arnett Gold Project located in Idaho. The company is financed and currently focused on the completion of a preliminary economic study on heap leach gold resources at Mercure and continued exploration along five kilometers of underexplored structure at the company's multi-million ounce orogenic gold system at Bear Track Arnett. For more information, please visit www.revival-gold.com. Welcome back for part two. We really appreciate our sponsor for supporting the channel and helping to bring you a deeper dive on the mining news. Hugh, fancy some geopolitics? Oh, yes, of course. Okay, big story. <clears throat> China's Xi mining has pushed back on the Canadian government and the creep of its national security reach when reviewing mining investments under the Investment Canada Act. Xi Jinping is concerned that Canada is interfering with the closure of its 300 million US dollar acquisition of Peruvian gold and copper mine La Arena from Canadian listed Pan American Silver. Xi Jinping said Canada lacks jurisdiction over La Arena because it is an asset in Peru with no operations or employees in Canada. Additionally, the deal involves the purchase of an asset in Peru, not in Canada, nor the purchase of a Canadian company. There's a growing backstory here. In May, Solaris Resources walked away from a 130 million Canadian strategic investment from Jijin after a Canadian government review failed to clear it. More recently, Falcon Energy Materials redomiciled in the UAE after a Chinese company was blocked from buying a stake in the company. However, other Chinese investments do not seem to draw the same opposition. Jijin's 57 million Canadian investment for a 9.9% stake in Montage Gold which is exploring for gold in Cote d'Ivoire in Africa, seems to be acceptable. Hugh, looking at these, it appears Canada is applying its own version of the Monroe Doctrine, which is a 1923 US policy of not allowing foreign interference in the Americas, which back then meant European colonialism and now seems to mean Chinese investment in the Americas. Hugh, uh, what do you think Canada is up to and is it overreaching into the domestic affairs of other jurisdictions? I, th I think it's just bad timing for uh, Zijin and, and Pan American on this particular transaction. I think it was in July that the Canadian government came out with uh, this, this notion of putting higher hurdles on projects that were domestically, that are domestically owned and that involve strategic metals. And of course, in Canada, strategic metals uh, encompasses everything from aluminum to zinc and, of course, copper in between. Um, so, so I think the uh, the bar w went higher. The, the the Canadian government's obviously trying to demonstrate its action. Um, it's a bit much, a bit late uh, in my view. Uh, th th it's embarrassing, actually. Uh, we've got a fantastic mining industry, a cadre of people and projects in this country, and expertise that's uh, globally recognized. And uh, and and I think our, our government uh, long ago should have got behind the Canadian mining industry and some of the great things that we're doing for responsible mining around the world. And that means being uh, supportive of people and education. It means uh, being supportive 
of the, the business and our ability to attract capital, which is so crucial to these long life assets, <clears throat> long jurisdiction of uh, gestation of investment. <clears throat> but, it, but it also means uh, improving on the pathway to permitting here at home. And uh, from my perspective, and I think from the industry's perspective, we'd like to see uh, the Canadian government work on that first and foremost. Sovereignty and jurisdictional issues really uh, lock up a lot of uh, Canadian resource development, and uh, it's 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 really um, it, it's really an area where our government could uh, be effective instead of uh, applying a policy which, as you've pointed out, uh, seems to be having uh, unexpected um, uh, implications for international business. Now, one of the key implications, of course, is, is it relates to funding. The, the pushback on Chinese investment comes as junior explorers and developers find it increasingly difficult to raise funds. Recent years have seen China and Chinese companies become one of the biggest sources of funding for junior companies. Um, Hugh, so that, this obviously begs the question, if Chinese investment is often or to be deemed inappropriate, where will the money for the sector come from? Exactly. Uh, it's a great question. And uh, as we see this, the, the world becoming smaller and smaller, and the uh, strategic nature of mineral resources becoming uh, more important, um, we've, got to, we've, got to, uh, we've got to find ways to allow Canadian companies to attract capital, um, find the good people, and uh, be able to put them to work around the world. Uh, for the benefit of our of our communities and for the, the benefit of the uh, you know the, the global uh, system of, of, of activity I think the Canadian government uh, you know is trying to do something which is um, you know which is effective for the Canadian mining industry uh, without being seen to uh, be supportive of our uh, of our industry there it's 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 just uh, shocking to me uh, that we that we cannot recognize the central importance, the strategic importance that the mining industry plays in Canada um, with, with these mineral resources and how important they are to our way of life. Uh, we've got to do these uh, backhanded uh, moves um, that in, in, in ironically uh, have a negative implication for our industry as we, as we seek to, uh, to, to, do our, to do our work and the important work uh, of uh, providing mineral resources to the economy. I think it also shows sometimes a lack of understanding of supply chains because uh, when we're talking about copper, of course, an increasing number of projects will produce copper concentrates. And the main place the copper concentrates go for smelting into copper metal is, of course, China. So um, whether the funding for the mine comes from China or elsewhere, most likely the product will end up going to China at some point during its uh, supply chain life. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's a little bit of tit for tat here. Um, uh, we've seen Ch uh, China last week come out and say that they were going to be limiting uh, uh, exports of antimony. Um, there are some beneficiaries to that, but uh, I, I can't think that that's going to be uh, very good for, for global trade and, um, and, and, and global business. So uh, these things uh, will come back to us. Um, and um, and in ways that we may not have uh, expected or intended. I'm going to put you on the spot, Hugh, with a, a question I've just thought up. Now, you mentioned Antimony, obviously, in your state. You've already mentioned the company uh, once today so far. Um, Idaho has a, a project that is going to produce Antimony as well. That's Perpetual Resources. Um, <clears throat> but there's also apparently another project in the Americas, in Canada, that potentially has Antimony potential. What is that project? <laughs> I, I I can't tell you the name of it. I, I can't tell you the name of it. I'm not a I'm not a um, uh, a very keen follower of these um, um, you know metals that uh, have are very niche metals. I think you really have to understand the the marketing aspects of these metals. Uh, one of the beautiful things about the gold business is that the that there's a lot of transparency around where gold is sold. Um, and how it's sold, and um, that's not the case with a lot of these uh, uh, metals that are uh, more niche metals like antimony and the rare earths. <clears throat> the, the path from finding a deposit 
uh, to turning it into cash is very difficult and it's very difficult to value and uh, it's very difficult to, for investors to understand. Now, I think in the case of Perpetua, since you bring that up, uh, it's important to note that the specifications for the uh, U.S. defense industry around the use of antimony, stibnite, uh, the mineral that, uh, from which antimony comes, uh, were actually designed around the, the stibnite uh, operation when it was in production in the uh, <clears throat> Uh, during the uh, the war years uh, and subsequent too, so that's a unique situation. We know where that uh, material can go because the industry has been built up around the specifications of the product that can come from that operation. But elsewhere, uh, I'm not sure it's clear. Um, I don't know the project you're talking about, but that's certainly something to ask and to understand. And uh, really, it comes from metallurgical data. It comes from understanding the downstream chain and the uh, the end users of the products. Well, I shall put you out of your misery, Hugh, and it's another company you've mentioned today. Apparently, in the Golden Triangle, Skeena Resources has antimony as well in its, uh, in its deposit at SK Creek. Let's end with some drilling. Hugh, what drill intercepts have caught your eye recently? Well, I, I, I have to point uh, to uh, the, the results out of West Red Lake. Um, this is a company, uh, full disclosure, in which I'm involved. they got a great team there, Shane Williams and uh, 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 Will Robinson, and intercepted 107 grams over uh, 2.5 meters in the Austin zone and uh, 106 grams per ton gold over 2.35 meters in the McVeigh zone. And, these guys are doing a great job of bringing the uh, the Madsen project uh, back to life, um, and um, and so uh, that's a that's an excellent result for that team. Uh, there have been some other great uh, results this week out of uh, I-80, um, 39 meters of 10 grams at the uh, in the Helen zone uh, at uh, Cove McCoy, and of course Dolly Varden uh, intersecting over a thousand grams per, uh, per per ton silver. Uh, over uh, just over nine meters at their wolf target. Um, so uh, some great results from the explorers um, and uh, just in time for Beaver Creek coming up in September, the, uh, the big industry uh, gathering in Colorado. Yes, and I imagine we'll have many more of those in the sort of, what have we got, two or three weeks uh, leading up to that. Um, I had the pleasure of visiting Dolly Bard and Silver a couple of weeks ago, uh, looking very interesting there. Well, that's all for this week, Hugh. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. Have a great week. You too, Hugh. I'm Paul Harris, and this is Kitco Mining. <laughs>